what's up? I'm Ben and today we're going to talk about ARB lockers and re-gearing a Dana 80. Should you do it yourself? What kind of tools do you need? All that coming right up. So if you're planning on taking on this project, I would strongly advise that this is not your sole form of uh, um, research or homework or anything like that. Uh, I did a lot of checking around. I mean, it was months of me considering doing it, researching it, thinking about all the tools I'm gonna need and all the specialty stuff. And once I felt like I thoroughly understood what needed to happen, then I got into it and did it. Um, I think there's a YouTube channel called JK Gear and Gadgets, a Jeep guy, and uh, uh, I'm hoping I'm getting that right, but I'm pretty sure he did a Dana 60 and uh, in pretty good detail kind of went through um, the process and how he did it. Uh, there's not a, really a whole lot of stuff that I could find on uh, the Dana 80 and stuff, and uh, unfortunately I did this so long ago it's kind of tough to... Uh, Go back and remember everything but i'm um, just going to kind of go through a couple of things here that i had uh, and made uh, in order to uh, pull this off setting up a set of gears and a differential um, there's a few things that uh, all need to kind of balance each other out so uh, one of them is carrier preload um, that is set with uh, the amount of shims and uh, whatnot that you have on either side of the uh, actual axle carrier that is going to uh, determine just how snug it is in the actual housing itself. Um, you've also got uh, pinion preload. Uh, that is going to be how much effort it takes to rotate the uh, pinion or like the yoke that the drive shaft hooks up to. Um, you've also got uh, backlash, which is um, basically you put a uh, dial indicator um, onto the big ring gear and then uh, you see how much backward and forward movement you have. It can't be too tight and it can't be too loose. The other one is um, your contact pattern. So that you put uh, like some dye or some uh, um, like a pasty paint on the actual gears and then you uh, rotate it around a few times while putting some resistance on the crown gear. And that shows you how the pinion and the ring gear are interacting. All right, so uh, first of all, the biggest piece of advice that I could give you or if I had to do it again, absolutely hands down I would have done this, is pull the axle out from under the vehicle. Um, in the JK Gear and Gadgets video that I watched, I think he said your first time doing it, you know, don't be surprised if it takes you a week or so uh, per axle, which sounds crazy, but like, I'm not even exaggerating. I was in here full time, like it wasn't some after work thing. And uh, I think the rear took me four solid days and the front was somewhere around that, like three or four or five days. Um, and uh, like the parts are heavy. I mean, you pull a, uh, you know, an ARB air locker with a ring gear on it for a Dana 80. I mean, the edges are sharp. It's heavy, heavy, heavy. And trying to, you know, sort of hold it in place while you're putting the shims in and stuff like that, it's uh, a handful. I mean, the thing probably weighs 60, 70 pounds, I'm not sure, and you're laying sideways and trying to lift it up and, you know, keep everything perfectly clean and all that. I mean, uh, it was tough, you know, and uh, I did it in the winter with uh, sort of cold shop floors and laying on your side. I mean, it was like it was a pretty big project i really uh i was ready going in but i mean it was like it was no joke you got to pull that thing in and out of there like a million times there's certain tools and some kits and stuff like that where you uh you know um can not have to guess so much when you're first setting it up um i didn't have any of that really i was just basically trying to get my pinion preload the backlash and the contact pattern set up right, and that required a ton of trial and error, so be ready for that. One of the things that's gonna need to happen before you can do anything is you gotta uh, disconnect the drive shaft. Um, when you pull it out of the uh, transfer case, it might be different on the two wheel drives, but on uh, my truck, uh, when you pull the drive shaft out, the transfer case just starts leaking. So uh, I, what I did was actually just tied a rope around this, and then there's a cross member. I just tied a rope up around that 
and kind of lifted that up against there. You're gonna wanna make sure and do it very secure. If that thing were to fall down and bonk you in the head, it would be a big problem. So uh, really be careful with that. You know, otherwise you could pull the drive shaft and maybe stuff a bag or something in there just to uh, stop the leaking or just drain the transfer case altogether. But just make sure, you know, that's all taken care of before you start driving away again. So the next consideration is uh, in there, right in there you can see those threads that is the pinion nut so uh partially uh the way you get a certain pinion preload is by how tight you tighten that and there's a range that it can be tightened i believe it's within don't quote me on this but i think it's about 420 to 450 foot pounds something like that um so uh, and then also you know the range is dictated by the way you have the shims in between the races in the inner and outer bearing uh, inner and outer pinion bearing just inside this sort of sleeve here. Uh, I strongly recommend downloading the uh, manual from Dana and really going through it until you understand uh, how these clearances are made because there's a lot of concepts that you need to understand before you get into that. Before you uh, remove the axle, if you're going to, and like I say, if I was to do this again on the front or rear, I would definitely just remove the axle. Um, but uh, before you do that, I would probably recommend uh, busting that pinion nut loose. And like I said, it's 450 foot-pounds. Personally, I did not use an impact. I used a torque multiplier. But uh, before I get out from under here, I just have to say these axles are really heavy. I mean, you might not think it to look at them, but, you know, um, with the 37s, uh, this rear axle, I think it's got almost 500 pounds of... Uh, wheel and tire on it and then the actual axle itself is probably like another 300 to 350 or so um, and uh, you really gotta think about that I mean that is a ton of weight and uh, you really have to just kind of be ready for it and if you're gonna put it on stands or if you're planning on lifting it onto a bench or anything like that you know you really need to think about this stuff and make sure and you keep yourself safe so over here uh, this is a Dana 70 I purchased this off a guy on Craigslist. Uh, this is going to be going in my Xterra. I've also got a Dana 60 for it as well for the front. Um, there was, uh, when we lifted this into the back of my truck, I believe we had uh, four or five full grown industrial type guys, like, you know, work boot wearing fellows that, you know, are tough. And, uh, yeah, I could not believe how hard these things were to get in the back of the truck with just manpower alone. So be ready for that. These things are heavy. Next up, I'm going to show you some of the specialty tools that are required. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's all sorts of uh, um, kits and certain measuring apparatus that can be uh, obtained and used for um, setting things up. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's going to speed things up, no doubt, but at the end of the day, it's all about your pinion preload, your carrier preload, your backlash, and the uh, contact pattern of the gears. So whether you choose to do that with a nice kit or like an idiot with trial and error like I did, you know, it took a long time, but, you know, these kits aren't cheap. You know, you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of dollars to sort of set yourself up for it. And you really need to ask yourself uh, how many times you're going to be doing this. You know, is it worth it to just bring it into a shop and they have it done in a short amount of time? Like, you know, you really need to ponder those things because this is a pretty serious um, project to get into. Everything's expensive and uh, the stakes are high because, you know, if the things are set up too loose or if there's any problems and your bearings chatter apart and all of a sudden you've sort of ruined a rear end, um, you know, that's... A problem you really want to avoid. So these are some of the tools uh, that I made slash bought in order to do this. Uh, this is um, not the actual spreader that I use. This is obviously just some sockets and junk sitting there but I'm gonna try and demonstrate uh, the way I made it. I have already cut it up and welded it into something else so um, that stuff is no longer with us. Uh, this is a torque multiplier uh, I think they call it a, a four to one, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's actually 3.33. Uh, I purchased this at Princess Auto, which is kind of the Canadian version of Harbor Tools or uh, Harbor Freight, I think it's called. Um, I think I paid about 160 bucks. Um, I'm not saying that this is going to be, you know, professional mechanic grade or going to survive forever in the heavy duty world, but 
you know, for something like this, it seemed to work out pretty darn good. And uh, you really have to remember too, uh, if you're trying to tighten something between 400 to 450 foot pounds, somewhere in that range, I, I don't remember the exact number, but you know, most torque wrenches don't really go that high. And even if they did, you'd probably need a, you know, three or four or five foot bar on the end of it just to be able to, you know, tighten it that tight. And, um, you know, that's a whole nother can of worms. So I think for the 160 bucks or so that this cost, it was well worth it. And uh, if I had to do it again, I would easily do that. This here is uh, a tool that I made. Um, those four bolts line up to the bolts on the yoke. So I would put that, uh, onto the yoke and then I would have the end of this angle iron touched against the ground. Um, that weld is absolutely disgusting I know but uh, anyways it held. Uh, then you would have uh, the torque multiplier with the socket kind of in here on the pinion nut and then this would also be touching the ground and that keeps everything solid and then from there you would put a, a flex bar or something like that in here and uh, go ahead and sort of loosen it off and basically the same uh, operation for tightening it as well when you're ready to start torquing it together but uh, this setup here worked great absolutely no complaints whatsoever the next thing once you've got uh, the pinion nut off you've still got the yoke sitting on there and it's probably been sitting on there for 20 years so got to be ready to pull that off so uh, as you can see I've got two sets of bolts on here or two sets of bolt holes and uh, this was used, one of them was for the Dana 80 in the back and the smaller one for the 60 on the front. But basically I would just take the uh, pinion bolts or the, um, the yoke bolts that hold the drive shaft to the yoke and uh, put them through here so that this was on the yoke. And then I would uh, just kind of use this as a puller. And as this threaded out, it would pull the yoke off of uh, the pinion itself. So that again worked well. This is pretty beefy. This is probably 3 8 stuff here again uh, just welded a nut to it got a piece of ready rod or a threaded rod here all thread i think they call it and uh, just kind of welded that on with a nut so that i could go ahead and tighten that but of course any bolt or whatever would have worked just fine on there um, the nice thing about this is that it's threaded right to the end so depending on how far it has to come off this gives you some options so that also worked very well okay and then this second one here um this i made also uh, with this one here, because I had to have such a big hole for that socket there to be able to get through it, uh, I think it meant that it was going to be too large to actually work on the yoke of the Dana 60 on the front. Um, so I had made this one up front here. What I did for transferring the actual bolt pattern over from the yoke was I just, uh, once I had the drive shaft off, I took a piece of paper, put it on the actual yoke itself, and then just tapped it gently. Uh, around the holes on the yoke with a ball peen hammer and that gave me a template that I could then uh, carry over to the steel and drill out. You really need to be ready to uh, you know hold those yokes tight as you're torquing them or as you're loosening them off or whatever so I just made these things out of some junk I had around. I mean I'm not claiming expert craftsmanship on any of this stuff but it worked just fine. So you're definitely going to need a dial indicator when you're setting this stuff up. You need it for uh, making sure you don't spread the case too far as well as uh, making sure that your backlash and stuff like that is set up properly. Just got a dial indicator there and a um, magnetic block and then uh, the arm sort of hooks up to that. Uh, used this a bunch, worked fine. I would love to have a nice stare at or something like that but honestly uh, this thing seemed to do it just fine. So the next thing you're going to need is a case spreader and uh, this is something you could probably find online. Uh, again I just decided to make my own but uh, that was one area where I did not make it beefy enough. I think we would call this like half inch. Um, I would probably go more like three quarter or something like that. It definitely did bend and stuff. And uh, it was fine on the Dana 60, but on the 80, it took considerable more effort to uh, spread that case apart. Um, so anyways, uh, this is like just a basic sort of representation of how it was. I took some pieces of tubing. Obviously, I didn't use sockets, but... Just some little pieces of tube about two inches long and I would have the threaded rod go through that with uh, washers um, on the inside and then uh, these nuts against them and as you spread the nuts out and unthread them it moves these two halves or these two sort of frames apart and uh, that is what spreads it. So I did the top and the bottom 
equally and evenly and really tried to be careful and you know put the uh, dial indicator in a spot that's kind of central so you're not just looking at the top or the bottom too much and uh, often as you tighten one the other one might loosen it off a little bit um, in the overall amount that's spreading so it's finicky you just got to keep an eye on it and spread it pretty sure it was 15 thousandths and then uh, I think there maybe you, you don't want to leave the spreader on there you try and keep it off unless you're actually working with it but uh, basically I just had a piece of uh, flat quarter inch stuff quarter inch flat bar with one of these welded on each side and the threaded rod so if I were you uh, I would go much beefier like I really like working with 3-8 stuff any chance I can so I probably would have gone with something like that and then just have some uh, round tubing welded on the ends with the threaded rod sort of going through it and the washer and the nut and as you unwind it it spreads this and then spreads that and spreads this and spreads that so that's basically it pneumatic bearing race and seal driver set you're probably going to need something like this because uh, on the dana 80 especially there's uh, a lot of uh, driving the races in and out and um you know you could probably uh pop them out i think i just used a hunk of brass it can be pretty tough to uh reach in there uh and bang the uh, outer one out of there so uh, i just bought this hunk of brass from a uh, metal supply store this is probably three quarter inch or so something like that it was actually pretty expensive i think it was about 30 bucks canadian for that but worked great you know i'd seen some videos where guys were sort of horsing around in there with a hammer and a punch and zero regrets of buying that so uh, this is a little shop press this is a power fist 12 ton press this thing was so cheap. I think I paid like 80 bucks for it or something like that. So um, that is also going to be a pretty critical thing because uh, the ARB instructions are really good. And uh, you have to uh, press some uh, stuff on there. You got to get the bearings on. And when you're doing that, you really have to make sure and be pressing on the correct spot and have the right kind of stuff. So you might need to fiddle around, you know, with some tooling sort of things, old pieces of... Uh, tubing or something just make sure all your sizes are right if you're buying the uh, arb air locker for a dana 80 uh, it actually came as a dana 70 slash 80 so i had to drill out the holes um, to handle the uh, ring gear bolts uh, for the larger dana 80 size so uh, i taped up the locker really well because there's some openings and stuff so just tons of masking tape all around it sealed it up really good and then uh you know it's so heavy itself that i just kind of sat it on the table of my uh drill press and sort of went through and buzzed them in there but uh you know that's again you got to be serious and ready for it you know drilling holes in a uh or enlarging holes in a arb air locker that you just paid you know 15 1700 bucks depending on what country you're in uh you know you got to be serious and make sure everything's clean and proper and done right so that was another thing uh they need to be ready for in the yukon instructions they recommended to not use flame when you're heating up the ring gear to get it on the carrier so in my particular case uh, i had a heat gun and then a uh, 250 watt work light and i put the uh, ring gear just set it on top of my vice and then had the uh, two heat sources just close to it and just left it like that rotated it often and then uh, when it felt hot i put it on the um, carrier and kind of tapped it down with a uh, soft face mallet and just sort of went from there. So it is very important that these caps here go back on the side they came off of. So uh, I put a little punch mark in here. Um, you know, I, I think I read that there's a system where maybe two dots means left and one means right or something like that. Um, but uh, Regardless, uh, very important that uh, those all stay sort of in the same orientation that you took it off. Just take some pictures and just really acquaint yourself with how things are set up and what kind of things are going to need to happen. In the process of removing this uh, thing over and over and over and over while you set it up, I actually buggered up and uh, broke this line off of uh, um, the, uh, there's like a little um like a ceiling sort of thing it's like this little sort of washer sorry i can't think of the name of it but uh just be really careful try not to bend this too many times because i did 
bend it one time too many and broke and actually had to buy a new one. So it wasn't a big deal. I just went to a local four wheel drive shop. I probably had to order it in or maybe they think they might have had it in stock, but um, that's something to really be careful about. Now, uh, when I say that you're gonna have to do this uh, over and over and over again, I am not kidding. Like it's a pretty crazy process and uh, you know, the amount of steps and trial and error and pulling it apart, it was a real handful. It was uh, just days and days of working on it. Um, it was a tough project, but it was also kind of neat. I mean, it's uh, one of the more exacting sort of things that you're gonna get into on a vehicle and uh, it's kind of a neat challenge to get into it. So. Uh, no regrets. Um, you know, I when I like I've got this Dana 60 and 70 for the Xterra, and when it comes time to throw lockers in those and regear them, you know, I won't bat an eye at it. I'll I'll definitely get in and do it, but definitely this time around we'll be out of the vehicle. I could not stress that enough. Uh, just how hard it is with that big 60, 70 pound center section in the rear, you know, and the sharp gears and stuff like that, and you're carrying it in there and trying to lift it in without dropping anything and keeping everything clean and stuff, and it was really, uh, you know, it was a lot of work, probably more work than it needed to be. Okay, so like I said, uh, it's been a year or so since I did it. Um, everything is not super clear in my head, but I've tried to uh, remember as best I could all the tools and supplies and everything like that, all the resources to get the info. Um, watch some videos, uh, soak up everything you can. Uh, make sure you know the specific specs for your vehicle, you know, and getting that from your factory service manual is the best option you can get. You know, just really do your research, do your homework, make sure it's all crystal clear and just try and go through it um, as professionally as you can. Just really keep things clean and organized and, you know, just go through it and, and really be careful. And, uh, you know, hopefully it can come out and be something that can run and work well for you for years. Just be ready. This is not a quick sort of one day project unless you're some kind of mechanical superhero, which I am not. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of little finicky things and tools and stuff you're going to need to pull it off. But uh, if I got through it, I would say pretty much anybody could. Uh, this was one of the rare areas on this truck where I was able to really, you know, slow things down and focus on one project. Um, I have a terrible habit of having about 10 different things on the go during this, but you know, when I rebuilt the uh, transmission and the motor and the differentials, it was a bit of a different thing. You really have to slow things down and, uh, you know, just move through it step by step until it's done right and kind of go from there. If you have any questions, uh, let me know and uh, I'll do what I can to try and help you. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this is definitely not uh, the end all be all of research you should be doing. You should really have your head wrapped around what needs to happen. Uh, and there's some good stuff out there. Like I said, that JK Gear and Gadgets video, uh, I think they redid a, a Dana 60. And, um, you know, the Dana uh, website, I'm pretty sure, had the uh, actual manuals. And um, you also would want to cross-reference with uh, the Dodge factory service manual, too, to give you, or Ford or whatever vehicle you're uh, working on, but to give you their exact specs on backlash and carrier pre or pinion preload and all that kind of stuff. Um, one thing that I had noted that often uh, when it comes to carrier preload, um, they say um, more is lost from having it too loose than too tight. You don't want anything to be too tight, of course, but any kind of bearing chatter or anything like that, um, you know, if they're not tight enough, that's really going to, uh, you know, create the highest risk of everything buggering up on you. And that's a horrible uh, experience to go through having a rear end completely blow out on you out in the middle of nowhere or, or god only knows on some long trip or something like that so this is a project that you really want to take seriously you really got to do your homework and have it clear in your mind exactly what needs to happen before you get into something like this because the stakes are pretty high on this and all the stuff's expensive and you don't really want to uh, screw around with that please like and subscribe really hope you guys have a good day and uh, thanks for watching